Sorry, I'm not matching. Oh, oh John. I, I should have got a white shirt, shouldn't I? I know. <laughs> that's a blimmin' impressive bookcase that you've got there. That's the best bookcase. bookcase I've ever seen. You are one well-read man, or are they just they did just, just buy them in Oxfam shops and put them there to sort of look look intelligent? I've read, I've read most of them. There, wow. there's, there is, if you go on Twitter, there is the most indulgent and one of the longest Twitter threads mm. uh, in which I tweeted every single book on that bookshelf uh, wow. with a line about what I thought of it. So people have commented on your bookshelf yeah. before. It's the it was the it was the sensation of was the, it a, of the lockdowns. during lockdown. I was going to say yeah. I think I remember reading that, John. I love that. <laughs> I do remember. That is, that is the bookcase of of, wow. of the lockdowns. It's funny yeah, actually. I, I won the bookcase contest. Yes, you blimmin' did. It's funny how normalised this has all become now because when yeah. when it first happened and we sort of people doing interviews on the BBC via Zoom, it's like, well, that's weird. Mm. People going on news programmes from home, isn't that a bit odd? And now that's what everyone does. Yeah. It's just the amount of times I'm listening to the Today programme and someone's line goes funny. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, well, don't don't pay up the radio <laughs> car anymore, yeah. do you, uh, John? And let's... it's completely normal at work as well. You you have you have Zoom meetings mm. uh, or hybrid. Yeah. I mean, we at the Independent, we have hybrid meetings. We have, oh. you know, half, half the people are in the room and half of them are on the wall. Yeah, same. Oh, I kind of like, when you say half of them are on the wall, it reminds me of something from a Bond film, you know? <laughs> yeah. like, all the sort of evil people from the organisation in a big futuristic lair. Um, let's talk about, what well, look, I can't have you on and not talk about Sir Keir Starmer and what is going on. I mean, Twitter is alive today with gossip and i've been saying for a, a while now um when you get you know the first story out about there's some clothes being given you think eh, eh, he's a hypocrite then you get the next then you get the next and then you think where is this leading to and speculation is rife that uh, the man could uh, i don't know find himself in a sticky situation uh no i don't think so no where, where this is leading to is a uh, is a vendetta by the right-wing press mm. uh yes he made he made some mistakes we knew actually about the uh, d donations for clothes and glasses before the election and i thought i thought it was a bit odd but people didn't uh, people didn't kick off about it it was only after the election when wahid ali was given a pass to downing street that suddenly everybody went completely bonkers although why you know he, he's a labor peer he's a friend of keir starmer's he's giving advice to the government uh, why he shouldn't have access to Downing Street, I do not know. But uh, that that seemed to to kick things off. But do we not know what sort of what advice he's giving, what role he has? Because surely, if you've got a pass to number ten, the most sort of um, you know important office in the land, you probably need some sort of job title or job des description or some sort of um, you know role that you're playing, rather than just bimbling in to see your mates. <laughs> well, no, it was a t it was a temporary thing. Uh, it's not important. Uh, it, it seems to have triggered a huge avalanche of, uh, of of commentary. I think, I mean, the problem was that the, that he hasn't declared everything completely openly or on time. Uh, Wahid Ali's donations for his for for Victoria Starmer's clothes, for example, that sort of took took the story to a new level. And I, you know, it was a terrible political mistake, but I think it was the result of an experience rather than anything else. He's not that inexperienced, though. This man was the director of public prosecutions. He had for a long time been the leader of the Labour Party in opposition and was very quick to point his finger at everybody else for what he regarded as impropriety. Well, that's, that's, what, that's where he went wrong. I mean, you know, it was the same with Tony Blair when he said that we had to be purer than pure. Uh, it, it's just an invitation. Uh, to the press to hold hold you to a ridiculously high standard. He shouldn't have. I mean, Keir Starmer shouldn't have pretended to be morally superior to Boris Johnson. That was that was a big mistake. Although, uh, you know, you can see why he did it. I was going to say Boris Johnson didn't exactly set a much of a high threshold for moral <laughs> no, exactly. superiority. No, but you should never you should never try to be morally superior in politics. And this, right. you know, it came back to bite him. It did indeed. Now let's talk about the economy here because uh, we've all been sort of you know deeply worried about what might come out in the budget at the end of October. It's not exactly like the mood music's been particularly positive. Uh, Mr. I'm going to grow the economy before the election seems to be doing everything to you know, put the living daylights into anyone who might want to invest in Britain and uh, keep their money here. But th there is potentially a silver lining here. It might be that uh, 
Rachel Reeves can tweak rules to unlock £50 billion pounds, um, and changes by the Bank of England mean more money will be available than previously thought in next month's budget. This is, is this something about um, intre you know, paying interest on things and not selling government bonds? Uh, it sounds like uh, sounds like magic and uh, therefore shouldn't be taken too seriously. I don't think. I mean, yes, there is, there are technical arguments about how much you can you can borrow to invest and whether whether a bit more government borrowing for investment might be uh, might might not be a terrible idea. But it doesn't solve the fundamental problem, which is that she doesn't have enough tax revenue coming in to cover day-to-day -day spending in government and and fiddling about with the debt rules makes no difference to that so she's going to have to put taxes up uh, or cut spending or both uh, and it's going to be very painful as Keir Starmer said. Well what can they do though because they've said they're not going to tax workers so one assumes that income tax is going to be left alone so it seems to me everyone's worried that they're going to go after capital gains tax and it occurs to me if this is going to be the government of freeing up a load of housing stock and uh, mobilising that particular market, if you go after capital gains tax, it's going to have the opposite effect, surely? It is. I mean, it's going to gum up the works. I mean, people are going to be reluctant to sell sell their houses because they'll be clobbered for capital gains tax. But I mean, that's that's only that only applies to second, second homes. I can't believe she's going to put capital gains tax on uh, people's primary uh, residences. Uh, that really would be uh, political, uh, uh, political suicide. Um, but she can't raise significant amounts of money from capital gains tax or, or inheritance tax or any of these. I mean, she could, there are lots of little things she could, she could scrabble about for. But unless she's prepared to touch income tax, national insurance or VAT, um, she's not going to raise very significant sums of money. So it means that there are, there are going to be some very difficult choices continuing to be made about public spending. I mean, could you accuse the Labour government of being a little bit too quick out of the box uh, when it comes to certain policies that cost money, whether it's setting up GB Energy, taking over the grid, um, putting public sector pay up um, uh, without well, no, actually I mean, doing the sums? Well, I don't see there was any alternative to, to uh, giving... Um, you know the armed forces, teachers, police, uh, doctors, and nurses a pay rise. I mean, they had. But, to, but surely you, know, you could have waited and done the budget first and figured out how you're going to pay for it. Well, I think <laughs> I think they have. They well, yeah. That's a, that's that is a that is a point. I think the budget should have been done in July. To be honest, I think waiting until the end of October has, uh, has caused all sorts of problems. Right. Um, but no, I think those public uh, pay settlements were unavoidable. I mean, apart from apart from the train drivers, which is why the Tories keep on going on about train drivers. Uh, but I mean, the rest of the public sector had to be had to be caught up with inflation because there's a real crisis of recruitment and and, and retention in the public sector. There'll be plenty of people out there who may well agree with that. Those who don't. But uh, no, like I said, if you're going to, you're, you're, the government is spending our money. At least do the sums and figure out how you're going to pay for it, and then don't change a tune once you've gone in office. Uh, John, it's been wonderful talking to you. And this is the dress code for next time, OK? We're doing with a turtleneck, turtleneck jacket crew, so come and join our band. What, what do you think we'd be if this was an album cover? What do you think, <laughs> what, what sort of music would uh, Peter and I be making, do you reckon? Oh, it would be ghastly sort of sing <laughs> wow, it would be ghastly. It would be Chaz and Dave. <laughs> oh, John, it's been wonderful speaking to you. And the album's in the post. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.